Welcome to North Carolina Botanical Garden. I'm Joanna Lalikas, the Director of Learning and Community Engagement here, and we're grateful to have you here for yet another program in our Saving Our Savannas program. So we've got a great panel with us today. I'm really excited about this. We've got two folks from our Saving Our Savannah Steering Committee and a longtime friend and former employee of Botanical Garden here with us. And I'm gonna keep my introductions brief because they'll be introducing themselves a little bit more through the process of their conversation. But here with us, starting on your right, on your right, yeah, I got that right. <laughs> Crystal Loya is curator is a curator here at the North Carolina Botanical Garden, uh, curator for our habitat gardens, and a member of our steering committee for this overall Saving Our Savannas program. Ken Moore is associate director emeritus of the North Carolina Botanical Garden and a conservation and sustainability champion. And he was our first full-time employee here at the garden. And then Julie Moore, also one of our steering committee members for Saving Our Savannas, is an, a botanist extraordinaire and endangered species biologist. So it's really exciting to invite and introduce these three folks. Thank you all for being here. Um, first of all, I must say, in the famous words of some couple of years ago from Joe Anna, when I was in the audience and I asked for the mic to the second or third time, she's for God's sake, don't give that mic to Ken Moore, you'll never get it back. But I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And um, I guess I am the, uh, very much the constitutional memory of this incredible botanical garden of which every one of you here has been a lesser or greater part of making happen. And in fact, I have um, discovered while here and actually reading through some of the uh, written history of the garden, I don't remember a lot. There were things that I, I was apparently involved in. I don't have an idea of being there. But anyway, the bottom line is great to be here. And all I can say at this point is hang on to your seats because this is going to be a wild ride. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. And I'm, it's very exciting that um, Ken has agreed to be here and do this. Um, the the concept for this talk was we were going to talk about the habitats, and I've been the habitat curator for a while now. But um, you know, my involvement began after the coastal plains, sand hills, and mountain habitat were all in place. So um, I'm very, I've I've heard some of his stories over the years. It's always fun to hear more. It's really exciting that um, Julie is part of this too. So um, I am I am the I don't know the ghost of habitats present, um, <laughs> and uh, we'll try and we'll try and keep these two in line, but not too much in line. All right, Julie, you're up. Just talk into it. I am going to talk into oh. it. <laughs> but what I want to say as briefly as possible. I was a graduate student in Chapel Hill. I was a graduate student in Chapel Hill, and I did a lot of work here at the Botanical Garden. I went on to be uh, with the Natural Heritage Program, which is the state's endangered and threatened species program. And a lot of the work I did with that program overlapped with what happened in the garden. And that's what we're going to talk about, about the habitats today, is those unusual natural areas uh, in the state that provided plant material for the work that uh, happened here at the garden. So that's my little bit of background. I'm a retired endangered species biologist, and I moved back to North Carolina about a dozen years ago, and I'm very happy to be back working on North Carolina issues again. So I've known Ken for a long time, and it's, it's very interesting to me that this came up this winter. We were having a conversation, and Ken said, well, you know why they're called the habitats, right? And I said, no, why? So Ken is going to tell us why they're called the habitats. Why do we have habitats here at the garden? Well, you would uh, logically think that's because the originators of the garden, the professors and um, whoever was involved in the early years sat down and had this beautiful plan or scheme and this is what we're going to do. Um, that, the, the, far from it. Um, when, when I came on board as a, uh, uh, graduate student after I came back from the military 
and finishing up my master's in English here at UNC, um, I came back to take some undergraduate courses so I could take enough biology to get into the graduate program botany at UNC. So beginning in like 1968, I think, I was a graduate student in the botany program. And as such, I was, um, my advisor was Al Radford, uh, who, uh, well, he was a great, uh, he knew the North Carolina plants, uh, but if it's just anything else out of North Carolina, he handed it over to somebody else to identify because if it wasn't a North Carolina native, it didn't count as a plant. South, <laughs> so, South, South Carolina too. South Carolina, right. So anyway, but I did, and following him around on a couple of classes, I became very familiar with North Carolina communities, plant communities, habitat, uh, as such. So at least I had a really fine introduction. Plus, I did early on when I came back, I, um, Bill Hunt, the, our sort of, he calls himself the granddaddy of the garden. He said, well, if you're going to be studying native plants, you need a copy of B.W. Wells and Natural Gardens. And he gave me a, a copy. And, and so B.W. Wells, Natural Gardens of North Carolina, as far as I'm concerned, became the inspiration and the sort of the textbook of the development of your botanical garden here. Um, and I was so fortunate when, I, at that time when I was married to Julie and she was doing some biological inventories of the various areas of the Upper Jordan and uh, the Falls Lake, she came home one day and she said, you'll never believe who I met. I said, who? She said, I met B.W. Wells. I said, Lord God, I thought he was dead. So I had, because of Julie's work, and you know, I had the privilege of being, you know, knowing a B.W. and his wife, Maud, for a number of years. And in fact, I think some of you are, are he still here and you're old enough volunteers to have actually gone with me to meet B.W. at Rockcliffe Farm. Uh, which is, I mean, it just, it just, it's wonderful. So um, we, we didn't have money for plants and Richie Bell, even before I was a full-time student um, or before I was an employee of the garden, he would call me, he said, Ken, we, we, somebody called him from maybe Apex or wherever, said, they're getting ready to bulldoze some wildflowers along the roadside. And so we need to go get them. We need to go rescue them. So I would, go with Richie Bell and we go and end up on the side of a railroad track in uh, <laughs> in like the uh, apex. And they're on the edge of the railroad track. I guess they were coming and doing some clearing. You know, it was something like butterfly weed. Well, I'm here to tell you, I would never try to transplant a butterfly weed. That would do, anyway, we did. And some of them may have survived, but so we would, our, our source of plants were things that we had permission or were called to come and dig them up because they were going to be destroyed. So um, what happened, we would go out and I would have uh, maybe work study students. We didn't have any staff at the time. We had a work study students and some, I think, early volunteers. And we would go out with what we had with our dump, our, our pickup truck was layered with flats and it had a canopy over it. So we could put things in two layers and then at, we had a step fan, which was um, uh, smelled terrible. It had been used for rat training. So we had we had a we had a step van that the a university got rid of because it no longer had the freezer compartment didn't work well enough to keep the animals fresh. So we used that, and we had it layered all kinds of layers, and we would use that to go to wherever we would go to to collect plants. So we would go and we would come back and then I would get out of the truck here at the botanical garden in our work area. And we would be taking these flats of plants off. And I said, now, what are we going to do with it? Well, we had a nursery area that we put some in, but I said, well, wait a minute. We have a collection of plants that were from a particular location and a particular site with particular conditions. And so we had a plant community, which is like a habitat. So 
it just seemed like, well, what do we do? We let's just put them back the way we found them. So then that was the way habitat gardening began. It was not some grand, thoughtful, uh, brilliant idea. It was like, well, I don't know anything else to do, but do this. Um, so that is the way we started the habitat gardens. And for many years, I, from the mountains to the coast, the coastal plain, I struggled in trying to bring plants from other regions and getting them established on our Piedmont clay soil. Uh, there were many failures. Uh, finally, in, what was it, 1984, um, we, there was an opportunity. There was a savanna habitat that was going to be scraped, destroyed, and that got picked up and brought back here. And that's a habitat that Chris is doing a, a, a remarkable job maintaining. But I'm going to defer to Julie because she will give you the details of how that particular rescue came about. I'd like to backtrack a minute. Why were you so infatuated with Dr. Wells? Well, Natural Gardens talked about why plants occurred where they did. It wasn't just hear the name of it and what taxon the taxonomy is. It was he actually was explaining to people why things grew where they did. What was it, what were the soils? What was the moisture? What were the driving forces? And that was extremely important as it just as opposed to just having a flora or list of plants why they're where they are. I was working with the Natural Heritage Program and one of the areas we started working on was called a Maple Hill down in Pender County. It's an unusual area because the soils are very, have a high pH because the marl that's underlaying the soil. So it was a different area. We were particularly looking for one plant species called Cooley's Meadow Root. And the herbarium actually had a room named for Dr. Uh, was he a Dr. Cooley? Anyway, he endowed some of the herbarium buildings, collections, not buildings. And uh, so we were looking for that species. And in the meantime, where were we going to focus? Pender County is a big county. Alan Weekly, who is the curator of the herbarium, remembered going to a site when he was in the geology program that had a lot of interesting plants, he thought. But mainly they were looking at the marl that was being dug up there and all the fossils that were in that soil. So he suggested we go down and look around on that area. And that was called the Near Quarry. It has a new name, I have to say. I believe it's Hawes Run or Sandy Run. We started working there. I was with the Natural Heritage Program. And we realized that part of the area was about to be mined because of the marl that was still, had been purchased by a mining company. And so they were going to be coming in and scraping the savanna vegetation off the marl. Now, right across the big ditch was an intact savanna that belonged to a whole, whole lot of people who had inherited it. It was a, one of the heirs' property. It had tons of landowners uh, in that small area, but mainly one family. And Fred Annan from the Nature Conservancy started working to buy that part of the savanna because of its incredible significance. But the part that was going to be scraped away, it was just too good uh, to not try to save it. And that's what led to the moving of the plants up here. I believe I was the one who got a hold of, seems like I always had to get a hold of the people who own the land. That was one of my specialties. We made arrangements and we got permission to go down there and do a plant rescue, as we called it. Now back to you, Ken. <laughs> So th this was the most uh, amazing thing, and I'm still drawing blanks on actually how it was physically conducted in one day. But Larry Trammell back then was the uh, head of the university buildings and grounds department, and we relied on him for a lot of resources, the use of a dump truck or if we needed a big tractor or whatever. And he was a very much a friend of the garden when he would help us out with a lot of that kind of, of uh, physical uh, need. So amazingly enough, we 
I, I don't remember if it was two, three, or maybe four trucks, but he allowed, he gave us the services of at least two big dump trucks, two of his staff members to drive, and they went down to Maple Hill, and I don't remember why. Well, I guess at that time we had we had staff and I, the only volunteer I remember going was Muriel Easterly, and I'm so sorry she can't be here today because she. Um, I, I remember seeing her dig those square foot uh, plot of uh, uh, what do we call them? Square foot sods that were about six inches deep and uh, we stacked them we took uh, pallets and we put them on the dump truck and I guess we were hand it was sort of like a fire brigade handing these uh, six foot uh, squares I mean six uh, t uh, 12 inch square plots of savannah putting them up and I think we put them maybe three or four deep on a one of those flats. Then we put a flat on top of that, another three or four deep. And then we put another flat. I think we went up as many as three flats or four flats that each contain uh, four of those giant clumps of savanna surface. Uh, sod. That was a lot of weight. And particularly, we probably had one, two, three, four, five, probably six, six uh, uh, layers. sets, layers of of those flats. And <laughs> this, rem the, I remember vividly that one of the trucks got stuck. I'm not certain how we got the truck unstuck. It may be the other dump truck pulled the first truck out uh, far enough so it could drive on out. Then we filled the second truck. And then somehow we came back and that was all done during a day. And I think that what, what and then the trucks I think got parked at the physical plant overnight. And then the next morning they were brought back down and then we had the effort of unloading them and staff and volunteers helped. What we did, we went simply and we just took with a flat bladed shovel, we just scraped the the existing sod off what was then a, a poor example of a, of a coastal plain, just stripped the sod off and then we set the real habitat clumps on the ground. And then we brought back buckets of the extra sand and soil, we filled in the cracks. So, and then we started with the fire ecology. So that that's what Chris is is uh, responsible for maintaining. And it's pretty close to the real thing. Well, we didn't know what we were digging up because it was in a time of year. So it wasn't like we could see the orchids or we could see the, maybe we could see the pitcher plants and the fly traps, but a lot of the plant material, we had no idea what, we knew it was diverse. We knew it was gonna be incredibly rich, but we weren't going for particular plants. We were going for the squares uh, to get whatever was in there. So that wasn't focused on just an individual species, which was different uh, kind of approach than we had been doing from digging up uh, bird's foot violets or whatever we were getting uh, along different roadsides. So it was a kind of an experiment for sure. So Ken, Ken has also told me some stories about um, how he maintained the earlier version of the coastal plain habitat before the linear quarry stuff was brought in. So he's going to go ahead and um, tell us that story. Okay. This, <laughs> oh, the, the, <laughs> um, I was absolutely, I had to be crazy. Uh, this is when I had no staff and I, we had volunteers and work study students, but uh, they weren't down there at the garden on this particular day when I decided, oh, well, I'm trying to establish this little coastal plain habitat. And I know I knew enough that, well, you maintain those, they, they require fire. So thank, and, and so I just went out there one sunny, uh, 
a winter day, and I think it was a nice, also there's a nice breeze, great, that will help carry the flames. <laughs> and so there was no call to anybody, no preparation, no contact with the fire department. And I fortunately had enough sense we and and uh, some of you, uh, most of y'all will remember when there was a fence there that separated the old Laurel Hill uh, gravel road between that uh, from the garden, and there was a, a wire fence. And next inside that cyclone fence, there was a spigot where we had some length of hoses. So I got a, a lot of length of hose, and I was at least logical enough to hook it up and make sure the water was running. So I had it there. And then I went to the far side up to where the, uh, on the other side of where the, the big panel fence is uh, uh, today. And I just, um, I, lit, I, I, I think I just had a match and maybe a little bit of paper. I didn't do what we do a lot of times now is put wads of paper there to make sure it catches. And it, it flickered out, so I kept doing it. And eventually I did it and a big wind came up and it just woo, roared up. We had just this big wall of flame and it was taking off like crazy, racing over toward the road. And I said, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have the whole Laurel Hill, the whole woods on fire and that's going to really get some attention. So I raced around cut on that hose and I had, I was spraying water around. So I finally put out the fire, but that was the first, and you are the first people to uh, hear that story about the first coastal plain burn, <laughs> the first burn at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. And I would turn it back to Chris, who is now in charge of a more logical <laughs> uh, burn sequence. <laughs> More logical, yeah. So when I got here, I started in 2000. And um, around that time, or shortly thereafter, the conservation folks um, started doing a lot of um, controlled burning out of Mason Farm and Penny's Bend, or they didn't start doing a lot of, but we really got our ducks in a row, got trained up, you know, the folks on staff all got, we got, you know, I don't know what the certification was, but we took classes, we got Nomex, we had drip torches. So we were ready to do it and um, went out and burned the natural areas. And then, you know, some time passed and I became responsible for the habitats. So I did my first habitat burn under the influence of all of the training I had for using fire in um, natural areas land management. Um, burning the habitats, burning in a horticultural setting is not the same thing, which I did not realize the first time I did it. And so with Johnny Randall in my ear and, you know, this idea. So when you're burning out at Mason Farm or, you know, down in the coastal plain in the Longleaf, you have big burn units and, you know, there's some patchiness and, um, you know, there's just there's always more. It's not like there's just one pitcher plant. So here I am burning the habitats for the first time and Johnny's saying yeah yeah you just want to keep keep it moving and you know like yeah this is how we do it to you know burn with the wind behind us pushing the wind pushing the fire ahead so the first burns that I did in the habitats were actually quite dramatic in a way that they are not these days so you know these days I'm carefully raking around all the pixie moss and trailing arbutus that we planted in last year or making sure the um, mountain laurel doesn't catch on fire, so we don't have to look at that burned mountain laurel until it recovers. Um, so uh, very different these days. And um, I think like everything else that's happened in the habitats, uh, um, we learn from our mistakes and do better. Um, so with that, um, Ken's going to tell us a little bit more about um, the sand hills, which is where I do my most obsessive. What do we, I, um, it's not controlled. What, what a, trying to think of what my what my little catchphrase is it's it's not controlled burn burning that i do it's control freak burning <laughs> in the sand hills okay so um i uh, naturally with this concept of habitats of north carolina and we were um well on our way to demonstrating that with various habitat uh, gardens from across north carolina um, and I love the sand hills. I think it's still my favorite habitat uh, of all of North Carolina. 
um, we uh, well, we were. I was trying to grow some sandy things, but it they were they it was not really successful. And fortunately, we had made some very good friends who became longtime supporters of the botanical garden. And one of one of the uh, supporters was a woman named Catherine McCoy, and I believe she was on the board of Nature Conservancy so for a while. So that shows where her interests were. And um, I think she uh, she related very much to the garden because I think uh, Julie was the person who went down and taught one of many, many extension courses that Richie Bell lined up all across the state. So um, they became uh, good friends. And then when this notion, oh, well, the McCoys came um, to me and said they wanted to do something at the botanical garden in memory of Catherine's daughter, who had been um, who who had who, who uh, had passed away, and so what happened was their family. They I think Catherine's brother owned a uh, a sand sort of quarry down near Aber Aberdeen, North Carolina. So. The result of that ended up in, uh, I think it was 1987, where we had 22 tandem truckloads of soil from the sand hills driven up here, and it was just dumped on the existing site where you find the sand hill habitat today. And then we had someone came in with a, a tractor and contoured because we wanted it to be rather authentic. And so the sand ridges and sand hills go ups and downs and up and downs with some low areas and very high areas. And so that, and we had a wonderful dedication and it was a big, lots of people came. And I remember Richie Bell actually walked around and pointed out certain plants to Catherine because we had photographs of that. Um, and I was absolutely thrilled. Well, that's, that habitat's pretty successful because what we did, not we weren't just rescuing plants, but like the Lanier Quarry, we went and we rescued the whole, the habitat. We just relocated essentially the top layer of a habitat from somewhere else. And I was so excited yesterday to see that the uh, rare endemic um, pixie moss, which B.W. Wells discovered down at near Spout Springs, um, that um, uh, Chris showed me some of those that were that were rescued from uh, uh, I think Fort what do they call it Fort Liberty now I knew it as Fort Bragg. Um, the, so they were brought in uh, uh, several months ago, and some of those are in flower right now. You might want to go over there and see them because uh, uh, actually, well, Emily o Oglesby has some incredible photographs of uh, the pixie moss flower. I'm going to turn it back to, um, uh, let me see if I turn it back to you now. I think, yeah, Chris, about the uh, uh, hoping, well, anyway, she's in charge of that and she's doing a great job. Well, that that pixie moss is a year ago. It's we rescued it a year ago, so um, we've managed to keep them alive for uh, for better than a year now, and they're blooming. And um, I don't know. We'll see if they we'll see if they thrive in there. Yeah, I bet I bet everyone in this room has raise your hand if you haven't seen it blooming this year. Oh, okay. Well, make sure. So we burned we we did the habitat burns, or we started the habitat burns a couple weeks ago. So in the Piedmont habitat and the coastal plain and the sand hills, you'll see parts that have been burned and the um, in the sand hills habitat, you'll see that that pixie moss in there blooming. It's sort of been the rock star. It started, I don't know, maybe a month ago started blooming. So it's been, it's been the um, go-to. Let's see what's exciting at the garden. Tell them how tall, what, how, how do they see it? How do all right, they oh, all right, look down, this, this tall. Like um, the right. So even though it's not a moss, it certainly has the appearance of a moss. It's a good common name. And, you know, I guess in, since we're talking about 
how things are different in a habitat garden versus a regular garden. You know, you think of things like, so this pixie moss and trailing arbutus came from these very high dry sand ridges. And you think, okay, I'm going to give it a high dry place to live because that's what it wants. And I'm not going to worry about watering it because it doesn't care. And um, I have failed with pixie moss and trailing arbutus in the past. And I will credit Shakita in the back of the room um, for watering that stuff when it didn't rain for the entire last year. So the plants look really good, but it's not like um, it's not like it's growing at Fort Liberty. It's growing in a very managed horticultural setting in the Piedmont, um, but definitely go see it. Um, so the thing that I want to talk about now is how the Piedmont habitat, which is the one that I've been here to participate in the creation of, has been different. So, you know, the these amazing stories that Ken and Julie tell about all of these rescues um, happened early on. And, you know, these folks are responsible and other folks at the garden are responsible for this amazing legacy of conservation through propagation here. So when we decided that we had this space, which was, you know, Laurel Hill Road extension, I bet most people in this room know that there was a, uh, I know a lot of people that don't come to the garden, but you guys are hardcore. So there was a road that connected the neighborhood out to the bypass. And we were able to um, pull up the pavement and replace it with a garden. And rather than focusing on the Piedmont that most folks know, which is, you know, the wooded Piedmont, we took advantage of the sun and highlighted the Piedmont plants that grow in, you know, sunny spots that were, um, you know, more dependent on disturbance of various sorts. Um, and so we were able, when creating that, to do most of the planting with plants that we collected the seed locally and then propagated them and put them in the ground. So we weren't starting with whole plant or we, you know, we were starting with these tiny little plants, which obviously over the years have matured and filled in really well. And we did have some um, collaborative rescues that were, um, you know, more along the lines of like, here's a very special site that's being dug up because of the new toll road in Raleigh. So um, Jenkins road, Die base site, you know, we ended up bringing some plants back, but most of the plants in the Piedmont habitat were actually grown rather than rescued, which I think is an interesting um, evolution. And then, of course, you know, the Piedmont habitat is different from the rest of the habitats and that we're actually in the Piedmont. So, you know, we're able to use it a little bit more. Part, all of the other the Sand Hills, Coastal Plain, Mountain habitat are really, you know, these like actual plant communities displayed. Um, outside of where they grow, whereas the the top of the Piedmont habitat is actually just these are the plants that grow right around here, and this is what you can do with them horticulturally. We also have you know the we've got the diabase glade and the roadside, so we're doing we're doing both things. But you know the the Piedmont habitat is exciting because of its relationship with you know gardening and who we are right here in uh, in North Carolina. So. Um, we we're actually moving much more quickly than I imagined that we were going to, um, which means that Ken's gonna Ken's gonna talk more about some of the old rescues that um, Julie was involved in and tell us some stories about the origin of the mountain habitat. I'm gonna make this very brief uh, about the mountain habitat. I think uh, well, first of all, the the current mountain habitat is a hodgepodge of a number of different uh, rescues and efforts. The main, the, the part that's the most successful is as you go straight into the habitat right across from the two little ponds uh, at the edge of the coastal plain, you go in and just as you're walking and you see that island that you have to walk around, well, right to the left, there are some mountain laurels that are doing quite well and, um, uh, some big boulders, most of them are encrusted with moss now. Um, that actually came from an area where Kathy, I mean, where Julie was, was um, uh, Julie was doing the biological inventory of the lake bottom, the area that is now Falls, um, Falls Lake reservoir and so she did the biological survey of everything that was going to be flooded and there was an area there that had some uh, actually some uh, interesting rock and we had a at that time Frank Parker who was working with us and um, 
he he was a real strong husky guy. He actually brought some of the boulders from that site, and those boulders that you see there now, with it that mostly encrusted with moss, he brought those from. <laughs> we rescued those big rocks, and we brought we we got the smallest smallest mountain laurels that we could um, uh, excavate and got those. So those are actually plants from that. Uh, uh, Mount Laurel Slope at Falls Lake, which is fairly close to where Rock Cliff Farm, where B.W. Wells lived. Um, the interesting thing is that I was making note when we were doing a video uh, walk around yesterday was you stand on the path and what, what you stand on the path now and you look to the left where that Mount Laurel ha habitat is and it seems rather low. When we originally established it, I, you could, here's a path, and the, 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 the slope really went up as much as four or more feet. Now it's almost, it's, it's for the most part level. Uh, so that, uh, but then there were other parts around there that I remember bringing and trying to put do a little rise and have a little slope and plant it, various things that came from the various mountain rescues and everything is really just sunk down. So it's, it's just pretty, pretty flat. The, um, uh, so in many respects, I think the mountain habitat is the least successful of all the ones that we have struggled with all kinds of, of, uh, approaches to establish it. But then you think about it, plants from the mountains, and we're talking about from some pretty high elevations, they don't like the Piedmont heat, drought, and the um, just, they just, they don't like growing down here in the Piedmont. That's why they're in the mountains. Uh, you can bring plants from the coastal plain in and they are much more successful here uh, in the sort of foothills um, uh, with some exception. So anyway, um, I think that's enough about the mountain habitats. And uh, I think with since we, we're finishing earlier than we thought, it would be a good opportunity to let you folks uh, some of you folks who were here may have more specific recollections than we, and so you can add to this storytelling, or you may have any kind of questions that we will address and however we'll address. <laughs> Thank you all. That was fantastic. So... Would anybody in the room like to add to the conversation? Yes. Someone over here? Not really a habitat question, but how did the Paul Green cabin fit in with the habitats and how'd that come about? Oh, that's, oh, oh, I've got, <laughs> okay, we have our own little, I want to put a little nose on this little guy. <laughs> um, well, that's a whole different story. The Paul Green cabin is very much another uh, rescue operation, um, but we will connect that because I can't say enough about Paul Green. I mean, he, uh, people now, the current people just don't even know who Paul Green was. And Paul Green was one of the most phenomenal North Carolinians that we have ever had. And he was so far ahead of his time with uh, the rights. I mean, he was the first he, he was a person who was able with his own resources and connections with the North Carolina governor. And uh, he, he was able to prove and bring off of death row a, a black man who had been accused of a murder up in the, the Western, one of the Northwestern counties. Anyway, they don't know well, I, I will. Um, and so uh, anyway, he's responsible for the first black man brought off of death row and exonerated and released. And the story goes on. Um, and he wrote so many things. One of the 
whistling to you. Um, he, well, let me, let me tell you, he, he was an incredible playwright. He started the outdoor dramas, the, um, uh, what's the one up there, the Manio, the, um, what, the Lost Colony, he wrote that. And that just began a whole stream of outdoor dramas in and, and other states. He was responsible for writing many of them. Uh, I will, and, and he was often called to Hollywood to help write um, some of the scripts for the movies. Now I'll have to tell you this one. I think it was called, the, the movie was uh, uh, Cabin in the Woods or anyway, it was a cabin, Cabin in the Cotton. And he was called up to help choose the 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 uh, uh, the actors for that particular movie, and when he got there, they said, "Well, he was introducing them around." To, he said, "Well, we already have picked the person to uh, to play the lead part, um, but for somehow when she got, he said, no, that's not going to work. She's not going to work.'" Uh, Betty Davis came up. He said, "That's your woman." So he selected. Betty Davis to play the lead role in that movie. And her favorite line in that movie is the one that he wrote. And I don't know if any of you remember this, but it's, I, he, she comes to the door and, and answers the door to whoever is suiting her in, in the movie. And she said, well, I'd love to kiss you, but I just washed my hair. And, and um, so, I mean, he, he, uh, he the, the, the one thing, and we have it here, he, he, um, his passion was for the people, the real people who lived in what he called the valley, which is the Cape Fear River Valley. He, lived, he grew up near Lilling, Lillington, and he, even when he was up here as a professor at UNC, he always kept in his pocket a little clump of, of note cards. And every day he would be interacting with people and he would take notes of their stories or their comments. And he, he loved the people in the valley and he would go down there. And, and so that came, uh, that was his favorite, favorite writing. And uh, on his dying bed, his, he was promised that um, his his notebook, his notes would become the um, the Paul Green Word Book, which is a two volume thing. And from that, one of his daughters, Betsy Green Moyer, from up in uh, uh, New England, she got into flower photography, and she got sort of a, a notion. Well, let's go through Dad's Word Book and pull out all the references to to flowers. And so the Paul Green plant book, which we have uh, for sale in the, in the gift shop, are the excerpts from that two volume word book, which are specific to plants. And there were many times that Paul Green came to the botany department with little specimens of plants wanting to know what they were. And uh, yeah. well, that's enough, I mean, that, it, it can go on. Ken, thank you but, for that. We, sure. we were, uh, uh, we had the privilege of having uh, his daughter come and speak yeah, last I, fall. And we have a wonderful right, recording yeah. of her presentation right. online. And, Meanwhile, well, we have we do have well, a wait, question. I, yeah, well, well, I forgot. Uh, Julie just reminded me that. Well, how did the guard, uh, the cabin get here? Well, when they they are originally home up on Grid, Greenwood uh, uh, Greenwood Road, it, it was being sold, and Paul Green, where he did all of his creative writing, he would leave the house in the morning, go into the, what he what we now call the Paul Green cabin. He would close himself up in there and he would do all of his creative writing. Well, when it uh, came to be that it was going to be, uh, uh, that property was going to be sold and they were just going to bulldoze the cabin. So we got called in and, and uh, so after many, many efforts of volunteers and staff and what have you the cabin is now here and it's a real resource uh, so uh, thank you thank you thank you and david just shared the link to that recording with the zoom folks and we'll send it out to folks in the room as well and we do have a horticultural question 
online. David? Sure. Uh, what are your best tips for someone who wants to establish a habitat garden to replace a lawn? Uh, where to find plants and info on appropriate native plants? Go ahead. I've, I've always wanted to live in a residential area where everybody, the homeowners association, everybody had to have a lawn. Um, where, I, where Kathy and I live now up in Abington, we're in a, a co-housing community that's very much that situation. You look up and down the little pathway in between and you look down at our place, all on three sides because we are on an end unit. It's, um, it just looks like all tall weeds and, and, and people are just, oh, that looks so mad. Most of the people are getting excited because they're seeing all the birds and everything are still running around in there. Um, what I would recommend is first of all, you allow all the leaves on existing, make sure you don't have any exotic invasive trees and hopefully make sure that, hopefully you have native trees, but when the leaves fall, leave them right where they are. And if necessary, add some, you know, a little bit of, uh, of, of mulch on top of those rotting leaves to make sure those leaves don't get blown away. And then if, if you, uh, so that takes care, I just, just leave the leaves alone and things will start happening. Um, yeah, if you want to, you can put a little fern or a, 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 a woodland wildflower in there, but just be careful because the trees roots are the most important thing. Now go out into the lawn and what I've always thought, make sure all of your neighbors know that you have a lawnmower and you know how to use it. So you go around the periphery all the way around and you mow at least one or two more whips so that, oh, well they do, they do have a lot more and they're mowing. And then you start, you start covering up, just start covering up with mulch or whatever, uh, sort of make them irregular designs or you can just do a circle, but start covering up patches of grass and then what you to, to get a start, uh, go ahead and get some things like black eyed Susans or cone flowers or whatever, and just carefully plant those in. Uh, as you've, you've got really horrible uh, soil because the grass is all compacted. Or but just work in some young wildflowers and, and water them, keep water and make them. And then I would put some signs, put some labels up. I put a, a bird box or a raised bird bath, although birds really prefer the, the baths on the ground. Um, put it, so this is my pollinator garden, or this is my bird habitat or wildlife habitat or wildflower garden. Put something there so the people know that this is a garden. This is your garden. And eventually you can get rid of the lawn and, that's, and then it's more like you live in the forest. And let's face it, if you want to keep all the interesting butterflies, all of the critters that the caterpillars and things that baby birds have to have little caterpillars to survive, if they fall on the bare hard lawn surface or uh, underneath a tree where they fall usually fall from at, on a, on a a hard surface or on the sidewalk or a pathway, they're gonna die. But if you wanna keep all the birds and the things that you love so much, go natural. And it can be done, just do it slowly. Thanks, Ken. Um, and this is really a, a privilege to, you know, have 30, 40 years of, you know, sort of familiarity and knowledge about the origin of the habitat garden. So I have, they've been great stories and uh, I'd love to sort of uh, take advantage of this moment and ask you all, could you share some other stories about specific species that have been challenging or opportunities for creative problem solving to maintain in the habitats? What's the question, Josh? Yeah, what's been what's what's been hard? So the question is, what's been hard to grow? And how do you problem solve? Or do you have something in particular that you for anyone for anyone that's missed who's asking Most, the question? This is Dan Stern, the sure. director of horticulture at the Botanical Garden. Yeah, I think um, I just I I wanted to uh, maybe sh um, was hoping that maybe you all could share with some of the folks here. Um, you know, some of the nuances to maintaining these habitats that are representative 
um, most recently uh, Resurrection Fern, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, um, okay, Resurrection Fern, as an example, um, is a tricky thing, you know, in terms of having it in a garden to begin with, where are you going to get Resurrection Fern? So, you know, this sort of like back and forth between rescue versus propagation the reason that we have re that we have um resurrection fern in the garden is because the one tree in my neighborhood that had resurrection fern on it came down across the road so we cut up the log and we brought it to the garden to display that plant because there was no other place for it to you know it's 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 space in in my neighborhood no longer existed um, and so that has, I can't, it's, it's lasted, I don't know, it's, it hasn't been a year yet, um, but it's a tough little guy. And my strategy for, for maximizing the um, potential for it surviving was I put it everywhere. So um, there is some by the stream in the herb garden. Um, it is at the top of the Piedmont habitat when you come right in. It is tucked under some cross vine, you know, just sort of stuck to a tree trunk in the mountain habitat by the vine itself. I have put it on rocks throughout the mountain habitat, and there are two different logs. Um, and so, you know, in the real world, resurrection fern grows both on um, tree trunks and on on rocks. Um, and and so far it's doing well. So um, that's a that's an interesting challenge and an interesting question. The one thing that I, I will say, um, and and this is also I'll, I'll I'm going to talk too much. I'm getting no, I'm, no, I'm just talking. Well, um, you know, this whole the the phrase habitat gardens has always been kind of confusing and rankling to me as um, the person, the curator of the habitat gardens, because it means so many different things. So I think that we're here talking about these particular plant collections that are representative of actual places in the world, you know, actual plant communities. But, you know, the our question that we had from Zoom is addressing habitat gardens as a habitat for wildlife and plant species. And, um, you know, the, the habitat gardens in the sense of like, do I want to create a Sandhills habitat garden in my Piedmont yard? The answer is no, don't do that. You know, grow the Piedmont plants. You know, they belong here. It's much easier to grow them here. They're the ones that are going to support the most biodiversity. Um, but, you know, because we're doing this at a botanical garden and the impact of the habitats is tremendous in terms of the educational opportunity for all of the school kids and folks that aren't going to see the coastal plain plants or the mountain plants who have just come to the Piedmont of North Carolina and they're not going to see the rest of the southeastern United States. Um, anyway, it's amazing. But we do have to really jump through some hoops to try and keep the plants alive. And like Ken's mountain habitat reference, um, we have irrigation in there. We have a closed canopy to try and keep it cooler. And it's still a challenge. All right, enough. I think we have time for about one more question here. OK, this is to Julie. Um, so you made reference to uh, when you were all, or maybe it was Ken, um, digging up the one foot square sod layers. Um, but you made reference to that there was marl underneath that. Uh, so my my question is, do you try to duplicate that here? Because that obviously had, the geology had something to do with, with why that pixie moss was growing or whatever else was you were describing. You're asking about the area at Lanier Quarry. And yeah. the, the marl that was underneath there, is that correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. The thing... and I guess the, the broader question is, is, you know, it's not just the plants and the, the six inch layer of soil, but it's what's it's what's underneath, you know, it's that's creating that habitat. In this case, uh, the marl was underneath and that was what was being mined, but there was a good uh, foot or foot and a half of soil that had evolved. The thing that drove that system, which is part of what Save Our Savannas is all about, is the fire. That area was burned regularly, so there were no trees. There was no woody material in there. And uh, I heard a terrible report just yesterday that property was given to the state of North Carolina who is not managing it correctly. 
and it is now full of shrubs. It's already disappeared. The savanna has. So that's not answering your question, but that's a comment that, that these habitats, particularly with the savannas and other longleaf habitats, are fire dependent habitats. And that's hard to keep fire in. We've heard about learning to burn. I used to be certified to burn in five states. It's hard work and you got to get the weather just right to do that. But your real question was about soil. Evidently, the higher pH of the soil did not change all the species that were there. There were typical savanna species, but there were also, there was a new species of allium onion there and some other interesting things that were brought, were able to grow there because the pH wasn't as acidic. Is that what you were getting at? Okay. So it was an unusual situation, but it was an opportunity that we knew that we'd never be able to get that many of those unusual plant species typical of savannas from one after one whole day's exploits in that system. I will tell one funny story. The man who was there who was getting ready to mine, I told, he said, why are you interested? I tried to explain. And finally, I thought, OK, this fly traps we're digging up. Each one you can make three or four dollars out of. And he said, I can make more money out of fly traps than Marl, can't I? So he got the picture, but from a different angle completely, because he'd been mining that site for eons. What are the values? Everyone has a different. Now, no, look, look, Joanna wants to stay right on, 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 on time, but I'm going to it in my typical way. I want to go back to uh, something that Dan mentioned about uh, how do you deal with uh, these difficult species. I would, I would say the 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 best encouragement for anybody to uh, work with um, a, a habitat gardening or what native plant gardening is take advantage of the things that are successful. Don't go for the things that are so difficult. I don't, why have, we all want something else and we all want the hardest thing to grow, but why don't you go for something that you know is gonna give you pleasure like cardinal flower. I remember uh, in the early years of, of trying to get the garden the conservation propagation, we literally gave away dozens, hundreds and hundreds of cardinal flowers. We gave them to people and told them how to grow them. And I mean, that was a success story. And so if you have a naturally wet area, you want cardinal flowers and it just go with something that will succeed. And if you let things go wild, don't worry about what kind of habitat it's going to bring critters. You plant it and critters will come. What I wanted Ken to say was the first experiments with cardinal flower were not successful. We found it at Mason Farm numerous eons ago. And for the first time, it was propagate, dug up and then propagated, but we killed it by mulching it. So it took several reiterations to learn the species. Each species you had to pay attention to. They're not all the same, but we really didn't succeed with cardinal flower at all at first because of the heavy mulching that was done. So. It takes experimentation and observation. You got to look at how it's working in the wild. It's all learning experience. So just get out there and start digging and growing native plants. Thank you all so much. This has been fabulous. And I really want to thank you all for what you have contributed to these habitat gardens over the years. These habitat gardens are really special to this garden. They're something we're known for, and they have taught and connected with thousands of school children over the years through folks in this room from the past and the present. So thank you for that. They're great educational resources, and they just speak to other ways that this garden is involved in conservation and saving our savannas. So thank you all for being here today.